know if you can hear me, so I go louder, right? Yeah. And maybe we should think about doing something. Maybe you can get closer, right? Or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm Nico, I work for Adobe. It's specifically about the Magento product, which is the best e-commerce platform of the world, of course, right? We're not hiring, right? Really, we're not hiring. There's a hiring freeze. As soon as that changes, here we are, right? And I'm going to be passing on to Alvaro because I'm not the star of the show, he's the star of the show. So let's welcome him, right? Okay, so um, uh, today I will talk about um, the decision we take uh, or we took uh, since two years ago in, uh, in Assurance, hire a top team and then uh, build a great product in more or less 18 months. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, my name is Alvaro Moya. Uh, I help a startup go to the next level from the product side. And uh, first, uh, I want to mention that it's kind of uh, an explanation through the decision we took. I think it's a kind of different approach. And uh, all the decisions need a context to uh, have sense. And then you can extrapolate and keep those, those learning and, and apply in other use cases. So first of all, I wanted to uh, bring a bit of context. So Assurance is a B2B2C insurtech. Uh, they were selling by that time mainly mobile insurance. Um, by that time, January 2018, they had more than 3 million customers in 12 different countries around Europe. And uh, there were no internet knowledge. So by that time, how they were making the decisions related to IT was um, internet. Uh, recommendations of other colleagues in other companies and recommendations from um, the different providers or contractors they they already have and uh, one of the decisions was to hire a company that was based in Berlin that had their own a small uh, CRM uh, focused in, in insurance uh, to build all the customizations they needed on top right so the implications of that decision was that First of all, there were no IT team internal, so all the team was uh, in the former in the other company, and we only had a PM, a project manager, that was uh, uh, um, keeping the relationship with them to um, discuss about the new features, the bugs to be solved, etc. But it was not a PM focused in IT projects or software development, so. We're not, uh, we're not really uh, techy or knowing about the software development cycle, um, agile deployment, etc. And on the other side, there were no code. So the uh, agreement we signed uh, mean that as they were the proprietary CRM, we had no lines of code available, um, uh, and there were no documentation at all. So uh, it was not a priority for the team and no one was uh, requesting this documentation about the technical processes or how it was built. So essentially our relevant access by that time was the product running and then a database dump. Okay, so great. Um, then the challenge I faced when I joined was first to hire and lead a, a team, then together design and develop uh, all the all the relevant features of the, insurance pro of the insurance product so we could replace the old one and stop paying them. And uh, as any project, we had also some constraints, mainly um, time, uh, budget. In this case, the budget was uh, the same amount of money we were paying to the old company, and the time was one year. So in one year, we needed to have something uh, more or less uh, functional uh, in the market. So the first thing I did was uh, prepare the whole planning, the different stages that we needed to go through. Um, uh, I will sum up. Uh, so first of all, I needed to start uh, the hiring. In parallel, I needed to get as much knowledge as possible. So we knew by the time the people was there, uh, we knew what we needed to do. We had, uh, we could make an informed, de an informed decision. Um, then together, defining the architecture of the whole system, building the MVP, the deadline was December, so building the first MVP, then trying to move all the content from the old system to the new one, and then uh, preparing for hypergrowth, uh, preparing the new features to have a fully uh, featured product, 
So we needed to grow the team and start the product refinement. These are the stages we put on paper, and the decisions I will explain today are related to the different stages, so it will be more or less like an index that I will follow. And the first one was hiring. So um, I was alone, no one was taking the company. Um, I needed to hire quite a lot of people, but the budget was tight. So I went with kind of a minimum viable team for the very beginning. And uh, the first question, given also the deadlines, were going with an agency or not. For me, that was the first question I needed to solve. And in this case, it was really, really clear. Um, I needed to go with an agency. Uh, the deadlines were tight. Plus, there were no IT recruiters in the company. The HR de uh, department was one person in Berlin and was not specialized in IT profiles. And there were no brand recognition in the market. So we were not operating in Spain so the people could know about us. And also, we had landed in Barcelona by that month, so the dev ecosystem was not aware of us. So I needed uh, someone to help me. Um, this doesn't mean that you don't leverage your network. You need to uh, always uh, build, grow, and take care of a network as a CTO, so you have around many developers. Uh, and then the process could be more efficient. And uh, actually, uh, one out of the first three hirings came from the network. Um, but it was not enough, right? So we needed uh, the, the, the speed that uh, an agency can give you, and then having the full focus on getting all the documentation ready by the time the people was hired. And that's why we chose uh, to go with the agency. And the next question was, OK, there is plenty of them. Which one is the right one for us? And uh, the decision was based on first proven track record. So we needed um, people that have contacts in the market. Um, so for me, uh, time in the market means more contacts and more expertise in the role we were going to hire, the languages, the programming languages, and also the level of expertise we were uh, looking for. Um, then also how they treat the position. So we are putting a middleware between the candidates and us, and uh, I needed to warranty that they were going to behave as me, right? Uh, so um, I needed to know that um, they were flexible, so adapting to our tailored uh, hiring process. Um, they wanted to know about our culture, our vision, our passion, so they can reflect to the candidates, and also how they were treating the candidates. So not just filling the position for money, but uh, taking into account how these profiles uh, were looking for development in the next steps in their career. Um, and this is what uh, essentially Robert Walters uh, gave to us, and that's why uh, we chose them. Uh, it was a delightful experience at the end. And uh, for me, one like um, rule of thumb to choose it is um, if the candidate is coming excited to the interview, this means that they were uh, exposing your passion to the candidate. And on the other side, if you are getting excited because of the candidate you are receiving the quality, this also means that they are also capturing your requirements, right? So they are really uh, being a thin middleware, and as thin as possible is, is better. Um, okay, then we have chosen the, the agency and we need to prepare the, 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 the offer. And you need to decide which languages are you going to use in the, in the system. And in this case, I went with uh, PHP and React. Uh, the, reason was, uh, uh, the reason was first talent availability. This is my first uh, rule all the time. Maybe it's not the most performant or it's not the more fancy, but at the end, you need to be um, exposed to as much talent as possible. And then PHP was well known here in Barcelona, and we didn't have a lot of time to make it possible. So uh, I went with uh, that uh, tools. And then the personal knowledge. Uh, I wanted to be as helpful as possible, especially in the first stages where we were not a lot of people. And that's why I wanted to know about it. So just in case I could, for example, prepare a prototype or uh, make a code review or choose tools or integrations or plugins or bundles um, 
in behalf of the of the team, right? So they have more time to focus on the core. And that's why I chose those one. Another question, junior, senior, depends on the budget um, all the time. And in this case, it was really clear that we needed senior developers. Uh, we needed to build something really big. Uh, we wanted to build it well from the very beginning, so it lasts more than one year or two years. We don't need to uh, we don't need to destroy it and build uh, from scratch again. Um, and also, they were uh, evolving over time. So first of all, they were designing and, and uh, preparing all the system. Then they were coding, and later on, when the team was growing, they were going to lead the different uh, the different teams or, or, or all the people um, that were more junior. So this cannot be done by a junior, uh, and that's why we chose uh, kind of an architect role for the for the very beginning, both in back and front. Then local offshore, it's also a common question in, in IT teams. Uh, we were recommended by the C-level to look for a team in kind of Belarus because a friend of them have told that they, they were more efficient and it was really cheap and this kind of thing, but at the end, uh, we were facing a complex project, um, and in these situations, uh, you need to be really clear with documentation, with communication, and you can have some issues that are uh, difficult to solve when you are much away, and also the culture is different. Um, and again, uh, we were looking for long-term commitment of the, of the developers. We were looking for a vision that was long-term, and their role were evolving, so I was not, uh, uh, thinking about a developer from Belarus uh, evolving to a team lead, okay, from there, from there. So yeah, that was the first uh, stage, uh, getting the hiring done. In the meanwhile, I needed to get for as much uh, documentation and knowledge as possible, so uh, we know what we will need to do. And the first question is, who to ask? You don't have documentation? So you need to rely on people. I was doing shadowing with the product running. I was doing shadowing with several different roles. Um, I was asking the PM. I was asking the the other side of the equation, the contractor. But at the end, I needed to ask people uh, from the company to understand the business processes. If they were not written, try to uh, have meetings to understand, right? So um, uh, first of all, I interviewed uh, all the different users that were uh, active in the in the internal tool, so the different roles, to understand how they were using the app. Then um, the managers of the different business units to understand um, how the different features of the app were related to their business business processes, and also how the things that were bugs or that were problems in the current app were affecting them. And finally, the contractor to get as much technical documentation as possible. If it was not done before, I needed to I needed to get it. And then okay, what to ask? And in this case I have chosen just the example of the of the users. Um, so they were using the app, I was doing settlement with them, and then my questions were um, the three main tasks you perform on a daily basis. Um, the three biggest pains you face with the current uh, status of the of the of the app. And then one wish, something you would like to have if that is not there, or something you would change. Finally, if there is any type of content created in the cloud uh, that you are using for your for your work, let me know where I can find it so I can I can just examine, like for example, uh, translation templates or any kind of diagram. And yeah, this is an example. I just prepared a quick type form. I put the results on an Excel to analyze the results and the most common topics. And this way uh, is how I get most of the feedback for the for the MVP. Um, I was asking for three, three, just one wish because I wanted all the people to prioritize. So I could be certain that at the end when the MVP is released, uh, they all have the main features they need in the system. And I was not just assuming what it was important for the for the company. Um, some tools I use to collect uh, knowledge for me. Documentation is key for for success. Um, on one side, uh, 
it's it, it's helping to spread the knowledge across the company also with uh, with new hirings and the information is not only in the head of the people that is currently in the company and then um, is, is, is helping you to avoid uh, some communication issues because you write it and then there is no confusion right so um, I wanted to implement tools that were easy to use it was easy to collaborate as a team that was growing at the time um, and these are some, some examples. XMind, I was using for quick mind maps during interviews or when I was thinking about the system or the product. Um, and also for quick drafts of, uh, for example, the, the first database model. Then draw I for some, um, some diagrams like workflows uh, of the business processes, uh, the team structure, etc. cetera. Um, I uh, recommended to start using Confluence, not only as an IT knowledge base, I think this is the common use case, but I was also um, willing to have all the information that is always in the JIRA tickets, uh, not lost when the ticket is done. So I wanted to have there all the information about the different tasks we were performing, um, and then the, the JIRA task is just a link, right? So JIRA is just keeping track of the status of the task, but all the information keeps organizing Confluence. And finally, Office 365, we were already paying for it, and we were not using it at all. Actually, we were using another cloud. And uh, um, I wanted to use it to avoid this kind of topic that is, I think, around in, all, in, in, in a lot of companies where um, for any certain document, uh, you are updating versions and then sending over email with different suffix, uh, and then no one is putting in an organized cloud storage. So I wanted to uh, improve performance and, and productivity of the team with this kind of online collaboration tool so all the people can collaborate in the same document even at the same time and then they were sending links instead of just sending copies of the same document all the time. And this was, uh, this proved to be, proved to be uh, really, really a boost in the productivity and, and the way we collaborated together. And a couple of examples of the diagrams uh, and different uh, content at the end that was reflecting what we wanted to do and what we had already. Okay, then we have uh, the team on board. Uh, we had collected enough knowledge to know what to do, and then the next step is defining the architecture of the system. And yeah, what do we need to build? We have the goal, we have a product running, we, ca we can take a look to imitate a bit. But at the end, uh, you need to be clear about what to build because the, the, the budget and the, the time is really tight. And for me, two questions are key. First, what you need, based on this documentation, priorities of the different business units, priorities of the users, etc. Uh, and then what you can, related to the, um, to the boundaries you have, these constraints like the time and the, and the resources. So for what you need, uh, my, my advice is that uh, the, the team not only think in the goals now or maybe in six months or one year, but also make an effort all together, all the different stakeholders of the company, uh, all together think about the goals in three years. So um, you get a broader view of what the product can become, and then you will be able to um, prepare for these changes in the future or these new use cases that maybe are not here today, but can happen in the future and then the architecture can adapt a bit more. So this means uh, less refactoring and less cost of uh, um, extending the, the current features. And related to what you can, uh, it's all about priorities, right? So uh, you need to think as a global company and you, and you need to prioritize global, not only the, the IT team or the product, but also the different uh, business areas, sales, marketing, all the people need to understand uh, how to prioritize so then you, need, you don't need to fight each other to make them understand that what they want to do, priority top one for them, if you mix with the other departments, it's priority 10. Okay. And then how to build it, uh, it's all about the lean mindset. Uh, it's again something that has to be globally spread over the company. Um, um, it has a lot to do with agile, uh, agile development. But at the end is that all the company understand that uh, you can go from zero to product or you can go from zero to product in different stages and delivering value in all single step. So for this topic, again, sufficient <coughs> of priorities and, and pains, um, I think it's brilliant this, uh, this drawing that was 
uh, using Spotify to explain how they approach to, to the lean, um, the lean uh, mindset. And it's like if you have a user and the request and the needs is to have a means of, of transport, uh, you can think, okay, a car is really fancy and has a lot of features that uh, are demanded by the, by the user. But at the end, um, if you just try to build the whole car, it's going to uh, take a lot of time. And during that time, you are not going to be able to learn over time if you are making any mistake. And if your approach is more basic, like he or she wants a means of transport, let's build a quick skateboard and then let's evolve over time. So at the end, they will have the fancy car, but from the very beginning, you are solving their needs from the first uh, delivery, okay? <coughs> So this is an example. Um, I was collecting all the different roles that uh, we could have in the app for the different and uh, the different actions they could they could perform. And at the end, for the MVP, we were all the only building the yellow ones because they were the actions most voted by the different stakeholders, the different managers. So it's just one example how we were approaching this lean mindset in the company to build an MVP really quick. And then finally, the technical approach once we have this in mind, uh, you need to define the product goals. In this case, you don't need to rely uh, so much on the feedback of different business units or the CEO. It's more than uh, you own the product, you own the technology, and then you decide which features do you have the product to have. Uh, and in this case, for us, it was really important that it was uh, scalable, maintainable, robust, and modular and tech independent. And that was guiding all our decisions in terms of uh, the architecture. We, go, we went with the AWS ecosystem, and uh, the, we also got some credits for, uh, for, the, for the startup program. And then we went with uh, microservices, the latest version of PHP, because we don't have any code, which is really an advantage. It's kind of having a blank sheet. Uh, we could well go with the latest version of everything and then experiment it. Um, we wanted to implement uh, message queues as much as possible for all the asynchronous processes and also implementing TDD and DDD from the very beginning. So uh, all the knowledge we were building from scratch, keeping it uh, isolated as much as possible so we can um, be independent from the implementation of the different uh, uh, parts of the infrastructure of the or the application layer. And then TDD, we don't have anything. Let's do it testable from the very beginning as much as possible. And finally, I'm really a huge fan of uh, the don't reinvent the wheel uh, principle. Uh, and for us, uh, it made sense to really focus on the product, which in this case is an insurance product. It has to reflect all the business logic related to the insurance processes, and then leaving things that are already well done by experts, just paying by the service, right? Like out zero for the login and authentication system, Stripe for the payments, and then um, plugins or Bootstrap, uh, uh, plugins or libraries like uh, Bootstrap or even APA platform. So we can focus on the what really matters for the company. So yeah, then it was time to code. It was around May, I guess. Uh, so we had until December to have something, and it was the time <coughs> to really build something and started to uh, started to code. By that time, my role was more about uh, more like a PO. So no more decisions related to the architecture, no more hiring. Uh, I was just planning and prioritizing the different uh, the different features and the different tasks we needed to we needed to do. And in this case, uh, one question that came to my mind is: Okay, uh, what do you do in house? What do you outsource? Because it was a minimum viable team. Don't forget, we were four, uh, and we were lacking off a lot of different roles or functions that you need in a team to work properly to build something serious. And at the end, the approach was to have something hybrid, right? So keeping this, uh, this team to focus on the core logic and then outsourcing some tasks that can be related, for example, to non-core functions like uh, sysadmin, even 24-7 uh, support, you, so you don't need to uh, handle different turns and people for eight hours turns. Um, IT support, the different infrastructure of the, of the, of the offices. We were in uh, Berlin, Zurich, and Barcelona at the time. Um, also one-time jobs, like for example, setting up the business intelligence tool or uh, preparing the UI and UX for a setting portal. And also low-value repetitive tasks, API integrations, partners integrations, uh, and for pixel work, right? So uh, this was more or less the team structure by that time. 
And then uh, it came the migration. We needed to uh, put all the data from and move it from the old system to the new system so we can get rid of it, stop paying it. Uh, and then uh, the question was what to onboard first? Because we have the content, we have the product, and then you need to fill it with data. And we had two options, uh, and both were live. Once, uh, one is all the old content, put it in the new content before anything, or onboarding the new partners that were coming because the sales team by that time was working. So um, the approach was uh, put the new content first uh, because we didn't want to duplicate the efforts. So putting in the old system and then migrating again, it, it, it was going to be a never ending story. Um, and then also uh, is less volume because uh, the customers normally were coming, the partners were coming with zero customers. Um, so this means that there were less volume, there was less, uh, there were less risk, and it's also that um, the MVP can be useful for them because as they were starting, only 13 flows were applicable for them uh, at the beginning, um, and then you can really launch something that is not finished and they were they were not going to notice it, right? So it was a good validation that everything in the MVP was working and then, okay, it's validated, you move and start migrating. This was for me the main error. We keep uh, onboarding new partners, new partners, new business coming and then we basically did prior. There were no way with the team and this was a, a problem we, we faced and this was uh, getting bigger and bigger later on. So uh, this was an error we, we made. Uh, but then, okay, you are facing the migration, how to do it? And in this case, my recommendation is that you define a stages because a migration like that is really big. You need to migrate data, uh, logic, you need to migrate uh, content like PDFs, uh, the signature, the policies of the, of the 3 million customers. Uh, so we define some stages that if they can be repetitive, it's better. And in this case, for us, uh, it was clear that if we split all the migration by partner, it was all the time the same, the same because all the partners were uh, following the whole life cycle of the policies or claims or whatever. And then if you do it once, then you can do n times more. Then for any single time that you need to migrate a partner, for example, the next step should be to define the different steps you need to take in order to finish uh, the migration and then document properly, and if it's documented properly, then try to automate it. But first of all, do it manually, so like fake it until you make it, principle. Um, and then if the documentation is good enough and then you have good communication with an outsourced uh, partner, then you can outsource this process because it's repetitive. It's one of, out of the four options that we had for outsourcing. Uh, but here again, choosing the right partner is key. We have faced so many travels with different partners until we found someone reliable. But it's something that it's clearly outsourced, uh, outsourceable. Then next step uh, is growing the team. You have done, you have put the content in the, in the box uh, and then you need to be prepared for hyper growth stage. Now that the product is replaced, you have not been including so many fancy features in the latest year because you were building something from scratch. And then it's time to release a lot of new features from all the other uh, departments that were waiting until everything was completed. Uh, so you need to grow the team and then fill the gaps that we were uh, we were facing because we were four or five. Okay. So the question here was which roles to hire next? We had plenty of uh, needs, but for us the most important role was product owner. This was the 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 most important request by the by the team. Uh, remember that I was doing it, but I was the CTO, but I was doing other things, so at the end I was not doing it in the right way. And on the other side, we had a lack of resources in backend, so that was the, the first priority. And the other approach we took is, okay, now we are all wearing many hats, let's start specializing, and then we will have some more capacity from the current team without uh, hiring more people. So. We, get rid of, we got rid of the IT support that we were doing it, and also the QA that were done by any single member in the, in the development team. And then the approach was, okay, now that the backend developers are backend developers 100%.
and then okay, the team is rowing, and the structure needs to change because uh, it's not working anymore. And then it's how to organize this uh, bigger team. Okay, so our approach was um, go by squads. So they were autonomous teams. They had all the same structures. So we had one team lead that was related to backend. Then two more backends, one frontend. This was the initial the initial um, squad. And then we had kind of helper role, which is PO, QA, and also the CTO that were more like transversal to all the to all the different uh, squads. In this case, two. And the other question that is uh, normally happening is how do you split that squads, right? Um, in this case, for us, um, we decided to go by scope because um, the the process and the workflow for uh, releasing features or for onboarding programs was so different that it made sense that each squad specialized in something uh, like that. So uh, this way they could keep focus, we could even uh, change the methodology for them. In this case, features were going with Scrum and for programs we had Kanban uh, because it was kind of repetitive and documented process that were from, from zero to 10, step by step. Um, and this was essentially how to organize it. Uh, in our case, this was uh, giving us room to grow because you can create more squads the same, uh, in the same way. If at some time you face a shortage of the helper roles, you can increase uh, the number of POs or QAs for the different teams. And at some point, maybe uh, you can put one per, one per squad. And also the squad was very small, so we have still room to grow the two squads with more backend and frontend developers. And yeah, finally, preparing for hypergraph, you need to start uh, preparing a backlog of new features. Um, remember, all the people is waiting for a whole year um, to ask for new features, um, and they were uh, crazy to have them in onboarded. They were selling to the customer that, that they were promising. Um, so then you need to you need to decide basically what to do next. Okay, it's another it's another moment. Uh, you need to automate. You need to start becoming a data driven company. And one ex one example of the decision we took at that stage is, for example, which business intelligence tool you you choose. Okay, in this case we go we went with uh, Sizens. Um, it's kind of a challenger for those well known like uh, Tableau, ClickView, or Power BI. Uh, but we chose it because um, uh, at the beginning the support they they were uh, they were giving was really great and they had plenty of tutorials to do so you could understand and jump into the platform uh, really easy. The integration with the data was really easy as well with plenty of connectors. It was really easy to prepare what we needed to prepare, which was dashboard for our partners and also dashboard for internal uh, intelligence. Um, and it was really easy. It was just drag and drop the different plugin they had. Then it was connected and it was filtering the content depending on the partners. So just do once and share with all of them. You just need to share a link and it, it, it was updated. They had like a small trigger for <coughs> alarms uh, when a third team value uh, reached a threshold or if it's going away from the standard deviation. And it was really easy, for example, to set up roles, permission, and data scope. So we didn't need to worry so much about it and just connecting the, the tool to the data warehouse. Uh, one drawback, it was expensive and it was really intensive in resources, so we needed a big server to, to host it. But all the others were exactly the same. Even Power BI was included really in, in, uh, in the Office 365 package, but only one part. So at the end, it was as expensive as, as Sizens. Um, and the other topic was that uh, it was only available for Windows, so all the infrastructure was in line in Linux, and then we needed to prepare a Windows Server machine. But by now, I think that they are already compatible with Linux with some some limitations, but I think it's uh, it's usable. And yeah, the the latest question: what to do first? I have talked about it. Uh, you need to involve all the people to learn how to prioritize. They need to understand the lean approach and the agile methodology because they will need to change the processes as well. Uh, they need to plan in advance, not just shouting and uh, giving requests every single day when they when it happened, when it, it 
it comes to their minds. Uh, so I think it's really, really important to train the whole company. Um, in this case, uh, we had an advantage, and is that uh, we were preparing the field from the very beginning. So, um, yeah. Uh, What, uh, what we did from the beginning is um, for any person uh, that was doing the onboarding in the company, uh, we were talking about IT as any single department. And in our presentation, uh, half of the time was dedicated to how we work. So uh, we wanted all the people to understand that we were working in a different manner uh, that they were maybe not used to, which is agile development. And we were introducing basic concepts of, of Agile. Uh, so by that time, any single person joining the company, uh, no matter if it was a customer care agent or it was the next CFO, uh, they knew some concepts like, okay, you need to plan in advance, um, you will have a point of contact, you cannot distract the team during a sprint, and so on. And this was a huge, a huge advantage later on when we needed to really embrace with all the departments and the managers uh, giving features uh, the training was linear and the adoption was much quicker. Involving all the relevant stakeholders. Uh, so if you don't have uh, the product layer and the product owner uh, properly aligned with the people and, and is working fine, if it's not working, uh, my suggestion is you involve all the relevant stakeholders and let them fight. You just put the conditions, you just say which is the capacity of the team to build and let them prioritize. If uh, there is a lot of features and there is not enough capacity, they have two options. They put something out or they hire more people, but it's not your responsibility, right? You are just in charge of making things happen. Uh, so if you have problems, put it uh, and sit them together and make them understand that any single task requires time and these kind of things uh, is really helpful. Then um, it's frequent also that by that time, you know, all the people, is uh, fighting by their own. So they are approaching anyone in the team, saying, hey, fix this, hey, do this, uh, uh, it would be fine to have this button in red color, whatever. So uh, it's important to keep the team focused by the time. And for me, the key is to set clear communication guidelines, having kind of a document where you are establishing how they can approach you, who they need to approach, uh, at what time, even. So like uh, mentioning the channels, mentioning who is the person of contact, like the spokesperson of the team that ideally should be the product owner. Um, also, I don't know, giving the time or if they have some manual tasks to do by the, uh, to be done by the IT team, set a clear time and then the team will do it in bulk, but they are not doing at 10, and two, at 12, at one, at three, right? And losing the focus of the time. And finally, yeah, uh, you need to master the art of uh, learning to say no. Um, is really important and here is like uh, you are on one side the the reference for the all the technical matters for all the stakeholders but on the other side you are the reference of your own team so uh, so uh, we shouldn't be afraid of saying no if uh, someone is putting at, at risk either the company's goals or the the, the performance and the happiness of your team, okay? So it's really important for me, that last question. So this is more or less what uh, we decided. It's plenty of more decisions during two years, but uh, it was some pretty uh, basic ones. Um, we did a lot of things wrong. I have mentioned a couple of, a couple of them, but we did plenty of them wrong. But at the end, uh, I think what is important is that the culture of the team is that the, uh, to make errors is valid and all of us uh, are making errors all the time. And then you know that you are covered and your back is covered by your team leader, your responsible, your supervisor, and all the team. Even if they are not in your department, you are all working together and you are all helping each other. Okay. So for me, the, con the conclusions are um, the CTO role is alive, especially in this kind of very dynamic environments like uh, um, uh, startups. Um, you will be handling different roles, so one day you are the software architect and the next day you are CPO and the next day uh, you need to handle an audit or whatever. 
So the kind of roles and the kind of skills are always changing and evolving. So you need to be willing to have uh, to be in this kind of environment that is really dynamic, and you need to master a lot of skills. Negotiation capability, leadership, uh, analytical mindset. Um, I don't know. There is there is a lot. Uh, you have to. You need to have architectural knowledge. You need to be aware of the different uh, technologies that are uh, moving. Um, you need to have this kind of vision to really um, um, drive the company further to the future, and not just uh, having ideas and then implementing them. So it's really difficult. Um, then you need to rely on your team. It is going to be the best thing that you do. It's like you empower them, and they will really take the lead. And in this case, for example, uh, I think the major achievement was when we faced the architecture uh, definition phase. We had the plan page, and for me, the key uh, the key thing I did is uh, transmitting them the passion and the excitement for having a blank page because. This is not something that happens uh, usually in an environment where you have the resources to make it happen the way you want, right? Maybe if you have a blank city because you are funding your own startup and you are in the early days and you will need to, hands, uh, to be hands-on, and not everything that you have in your mind as CTO is going to happen soon. So uh, you need to empower them. Um, you need to focus on the value, and in this case, it's very related uh, with the prioritization. So it's a global effort. All the people need to focus on the value as a company. All the people need to prioritize as a company. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to make this speech uh, and, and this talk um, to give you takeaways so you can then apply in other environments because you have as much context as possible so you can understand why we took that decisions and then you can apply. Uh, but at the end, if you ask me today, um, what should I need to do? Um, uh, what, what should I do? Um, I need to say it depends. It's the most hated response. Uh, um, always, but uh, at the end, it's not only the context. Uh, and it's really very difficult to explain <coughs> the context of a, whole, of a whole company, everything that is going on in just half an hour. But anyway, it's all about common sense. And this can be, this decision can be taken away so you can understand how is the process of taking the decision and then you try to apply. So yeah, final is life. Uh, I always like to uh, give something that uh, I liked and change my way of thinking about a certain topic. And uh, yeah, in this case, uh, it's, a, it's a conference from Jonathan Blow, it's, it's brilliant. Um, it's a recognized game uh, video game developer. And uh, uh, in this speech, uh, there is the link. Um, he's uh, talking about uh, the possibility of the civilization to collapse just because the technology is not improving but degrading. So it's kind of the opposite of the mindset that we can have, that everything is improving. But actually, uh, he defends that it's degrading just because we are losing a sight on a critical point, which is uh, setting the knowledge with each other. Um, it's really recommended. I mean, it's so a ex real example of civilization that were lost just because they were not spreading the knowledge and sharing the knowledge with each other about the techniques and the different uh, technology that they were building by that time, and it's really recommended. And by the way, I saw it in the in the blog of uh, Javi Santana, and it's a really great blog related to technology. But now that's all. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Muchas gracias. Thank you. It's an example. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. it can be 20, but at the end, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in that. Uh, but it's a number. It's just to make the people on the company think in the future. So you have use cases that maybe they were not thinking about. And at the end, we are more used, thanks to the agile development uh, and other approaches that we take in the, in the IT world, we are more used to think in advance, but concrete. Um, and you need to be exposed 
to that vision of the company. So when you have to build something, maybe you build it in order to be applicable for new use cases in the future, even if you don't build these new use cases, these use cases now. But it's always helping to have this mindset as a, as a whole. I can I can give you uh, I can give you examples. So uh, maybe uh, you are now here in Spain and you are selling insurance in Spain, and then no one ever thought about internationalization, and then you are building everything really tied to the local regulation here in Spain, and you are only implementing uh, the banks uh, or the different partners here in Spain or APIs here in Spain in a certain way. And then when you need to inter uh, go international, uh, then everything's tied to the way you were preparing at that time. So if you just ask the question, is it possible that this will happen in other countries at some point? And they say yes, then you prepare it with this kind of uh, DDD approach in a way that everything is <coughs> going to interfaces so the domain logic keep isolated and then you can grow uh, a bit more seamlessly, and then it's going to be much more money saved for the company when you need to go there or you need to refactor something. Maybe you don't need to refactor at all because everything is prepared through interfaces, and then it's like Spain is just an implementation of the system, but then you can implement another one that is France or Germany or whatever. Does it answer your question a bit more? <laughs> So in this case, uh, I hired architects, and these were <coughs> the natural movement for there at the end to, to lead the team. This was part of the evolving role that I were presenting to them from the very beginning when I was hiring them, uh, but they can answer because they are here. So <laughs> uh, no, they can, they can answer. Uh, they were the more senior part of the team, so it was a natural movement for, for me to uh, get them a bit out of the code and then they start to balance between coding and managing the team. But in this world, that's the team lead? Yeah, yeah but at, at that point, uh, it was more like the point of contact, the reference for the team, uh, tech lead, okay. name it tech lead, and also it was the, the, the point of contact for other departments to ask for a certain uh, technical capability or discuss about the architecture, it was the team lead that we're actually going to the these kind of meetings and then documenting this part of the of the business. Okay. Anything else? <coughs> uh, I have a question. So you mentioned uh, that you made a lot of errors with the process, and these errors lead to maybe creating uh, that your stakeholder doesn't trust the team or doesn't trust what you're doing. So how do you? Build this trust. No, uh, so here, the, the uh, development, yeah. you have to build this in order to, to make them believe that you are the right path and you are going to deliver what they are expecting. Yeah, um, I think the problem was not exactly in that part of uh, not having the trust from the C level, and it was more about prioritizing. Mainly all the time, it was about prioritizing. So they were they were trusting us and they were trusting our work, but at the end. Uh, they were not able to prioritize effectively, so even if we were saying, okay, we need to do this, or we need to refactor this part that is more technical, <laughs> if there were not uh, going to be anything related to the new business opportunities, it was like, um, it, does, it doesn't make sense. So at the end, we were all the time making uh, an agreement, and we always needed to put something related to business, and then the refactorings or in, in improving the system, for example, with uh, AMQP, uh, it was not happening in a natural way, dedicating all the resources that you need, and then you were losing the focus. You were maybe assigning, I don't know, uh, uh, one day for each sprint, and then this way, this kind of big uh, projects cannot happen. But it was not about the trust, I guess, at that point. The, the thing is that they were not technical, so this was an advantage uh, because they needed to trust. The, for, for them, IT was a black box, and they didn't want to know what is inside the black box. So uh, at this point, we had the trust, and we tried to be as transparent as possible. So they were, uh, leader by leader, going more like uh, 
having more IT knowledge, understanding what is having an IT company, which is what they wanted to have. Could you give an example on how you were prioritizing? Like, can you? Uh, <coughs> if you could give an example of how you were prioritizing features, like when you have like a lot of people that are not only IT, like you had a lot of stakeholders, finance, sales, yep. users. How would you, do you have like a sort of a framework or how do you get to an agreement? What's more important to implement? So uh, first thing we did was to be clear that they needed to plan 14 days in advance. So what we were establishing now as priority was not for next sprint, it was for the next after the next one because the next one was already committed. So this was the first thing we did. And then it was just an Excel file, having a meeting, two hours altogether the different uh, <coughs> representation of the different uh, uh, department. And in the Excel, we had the different section, the different uh, requests each department had. With colors, they were saying what is more important. They were ordering their own kind of backlog. And then we were going one by one, assigning more or less the capacity from IT. And then they were deciding, OK, two from your department, one from your department, one from your department. And now we are out of capacity. OK, done. See you next week. It was, I mean, it, it was not an established framework, but it was something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> there's a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, yeah, sorry. I think I'll save it for after the pizza. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, one question there. Yes? So, I actually have two questions. The first one is how did you hold the, like, the mindset of the stakeholders to start to find the tasks? So apply, applying lean and agile and this kind of this kind yeah, of concept. Yeah. So like, how do you convince basically stakeholders to get a bit more organized on the different parts? Uh, this is like the the what I said about learn, learn to say no. I was not asking for permission. <laughs> I was telling them we were like that. You either take it or we are going to have conflict. So you either adapt. At some point, it was a bit selfish, uh, but they they didn't know anything about IT. They wanted to be a powerful insurtech something was not not matching, right? So at the end, uh, this was our way of, of, of doing things. We were not going to go waterfall, of course. Mm, I was not going to enter into the company if that was the, the like the, the requisite. Uh, so I came with that. I said, okay, I will going to, I'm going to join, and these are my requisites to join. And one of them was having the team local. Other was we are going to go with Agile, and then all the team will need to slowly approach this uh, this methodology. Second one. Uh, so the second one may be a bit tricky, but since you took all these different roles that I some of, some of them I can relate, like you were required to be part of the recruitment, then the planning, then the architecture, then actually taking care of the development side. Uh, what what would be like the two mistakes that you say you could I, I were not a good PO at all. I, I were not prioritizing PO effectively because I had so many other tasks, and I was not delivering the value that my team was demanding. Uh, they needed much more documentation into the task, so much more detail, so they were not having any doubt when the, it, it's time to build. Uh, and I was not having enough time to do it, basically. So for me, the, the biggest mistake uh, was that. And that's why they were requesting for the PO, so we were aligned. And I was asking for the PO as one of the first hirings <coughs> after the first stage. Thank you. Question was here. Uh, when you prioritize uh, features that are coming from multiple groups in your in your client company, is there a is there a standard sort of uh, value metric for those? Like, this, do you do you try to tie it back uniformly to revenue increase or to better user experience or to a more efficient process that saves time yeah. or how do you because I mean because these things they come from different divisions right exactly. or come from different groups and the the value they create is is like in different currencies so is there a way to normalize those did you have a yeah. system so at the beginning when we were building the first product uh, all the knowledge was getting uh, in one shot we were evolving but 
in one shot we had everything. But you had defined and what was exactly at that point the value was okay. I was asking for the main po main pain points mm -hmm. and the ma and the main tasks that you are doing. So we ensure that you can keep doing that and that we are delivering the the most value. But then when it comes to all the stakeholders asking asking, asking for things, uh, there were not a common unit for value. But they were. <coughs> I don't know, they, they were deciding because we had so many topics. One is increasing the revenue. Uh, the other was automating because it was the phase where you need to automate in order not to collapse. So it was about, okay, what do we need to do in order to prevent the collapse? So, okay, those business are waiting for you to make more sales, to have more money. But on top, you need to do that if you don't want the server to collapse or you don't want the tool to don't have enough features for that partner. So. At the end, it was a bit of common sense, and sometimes we were prioritizing refactoring something, and at other points, the partners were there because maybe they, they were selling a deadline without asking us, another problem, and, and then you need to say yes or yes. You, you cannot go back and say, no, it, it was a joke to the partner. So depending, any single week, it was a different, uh, a different issue, what is the most value, but at the end, um, it was about being able to scale the business because in this hyper rather stage it was about delivering the value. Okay. All right. For the, for the different partners that were approaching us. Thanks. Yeah, when you decided to use um, a cloud platform, I agree that you can accelerate your development and, and maybe you can even save some operation cost. But at the same time, you have a strong dependency with one provider, which in yes. your case is Amazon. And uh, maybe you can even have some concerns in terms of data protection. So did you ever consider other alternatives? Uh, we consider data protection, GDPR, by the time that we were rolling out, it was May uh, 2018, and it was exactly the moment when uh, GDPR was uh, rolling out as well. Um, this was not the main concern, but exactly. We were really tied to Amazon Web Services. We think they keep being really tied to Amazon Web Services. But at the end, uh, you need to get it done. And Amazon Web Services uh, was a cloud uh, powerful and flexible and uh, complete of, uh, enough to have everything that we may need in the future and that way we're using containers and LDS so the most we can manage from the very beginning the better it was not a discussion 